Will you pray for me? God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I've said before, and you're probably sick of hearing me say, we're reading the Gospels this Lent. Today is the day we focus on the Gospel of Matthew. And for uh, today and the, the three Sundays following today, just know ahead of time that uh, my sermons will be a little bit more like a lecture than a sermon. So get ready for Matthew 101. Before I start talking about Matthew, I want to talk with you a little bit about what a gospel is. Some of you know, some of you uh, told us, in, at least in my session last week, that you had never heard the word before, didn't know what it was, and maybe even some of us who think we know don't. So let me just start there. And let me start by saying what a gospel is not. It is not a biography. At least not a biography as you think of one, or as I might think of one, not a modern telling of a life. The gospel writers do not care about early influences in the development of their central character. They are not trying to give you a glimpse into the ways that the events or the people around the character influence the path that that character would la later take. They are not interested in psychological profiles. They don't care about factual history, and they are most definitely not trying to be objective. It is a biography of sorts, though, if what you mean biography is a story about a life. The thing is, it is a story of a life that is unapologetically trying to convince you of something, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord and Savior. They don't want you, the gospel writers, to think deeply and come to your own conclusions about what it all means. I want you to think deeply and come to your own conclusions about what it all means. The person in the pew next to you wants you to think deeply and come to your own conclusions. The gospel writers do not. They are clear that their project is to convince you. It's a thoroughly modern idea that we can come to a text and bring ourselves and come away with it with a different notion than the person standing next to me. Matthew sat down and put pen to paper because he wanted you to buy what he was selling. When we get to Luke, Luke will be clear about that in the very first lines of his gospel. He will say, I am writing this to you so that you will believe. Matthew doesn't say that, but it's what he meant. They have an agenda, these gospel writers. They want you to know not only that Jesus lived and was the Messiah and the Son of God and that he died and that he rose again. They want you to believe it so deeply that you change your life now. They don't want you to sit there and just buy it. They want you to buy it and then change everything. That's why the story of the temptation in the desert today, right? This was carefully crafted to convince you of who Jesus was. Think about all the clues that are in there. First of all, Jesus is himself a big enough deal to be driven anywhere by the Holy Spirit, right? He's just been baptized. He's driven out into the desert. Not only that, but he's a big enough deal for Satan himself, the devil himself, to show up and follow him around and talk to him and try to bring him down. Jesus himself embodies Israel, at least in a Jewish mind, who, uh, the, the mind of a Jewish person reading this gospel, would hear echoes of the story of the people of Israel themselves, that wandering for 40 days in the desert is just like Israel wandering for years and years in the desert. People who read earlier in Matthew, if you get to this story and can remember the uh, nativity narrative earlier, will remember too that Jesus was driven to Egypt and invited back just like the people of Israel once upon a time. This is a man who's carrying an entire people in his person, says Matthew. Not only that, he knows his scripture. He can quote it like that. Even when he's starved and crazed and scared and tempted, it rises right to his lips. He's capable of great feats of discipleship. He is not going to be tempted or brought down by the bad guys. And if you miss the point all the way until the end, you will notice that angels come and carry him off at the end of the story. These are the kinds of stories that the ancient mind 
would have been familiar with. We read them today and they may sound like a unique thing, the only thing like this that we have read, but ancient kings and princes always had these stories told about them. It was part of the way you told the story of a king's life. Signs in the heavens and miracular, miraculous births. Caesar Augustus himself, the one who was emperor when Jesus was born, was said to have been born to his mother Attia, and fathered by the god Apollo after Atia slept in the temple all night long. They were trying to convince you that their guy was better than the neighbor's guy, and Matthew is trying to convince you that Jesus is better than Caesar or whatever other miraculous savior is in your life. Matthew believes that this is good news, and that's what the word gospel means good news. It comes from the old English words, God spell. It is no accident that the musical was named that. The old English words, God spell, are a word for word translation of the Greek word euangelion, which means good message. It's also worth noting that that Greek word euangelion, which came to us through old English and became gospel, also came directly to English and became evangelion, from which our words evangelist Come. That's why our four gospel writers are also known as the four evangelists. The proper title of each of these gospels is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, and on and on. Each of these gospels were collections of oral traditions that had been passed around for decades or more before somebody thought to write them down. These four Gospels share some traditions. You will no doubt have noted that some of the stories are repeated and that they were copied from one another. I'll get to that relationship next week when I tell you about Mark. I'll tell you a little bit about who copied whom and maybe why. But today I want to talk about Matthew. Of the four Gospels, it was probably the second, but maybe the third to be written down. It was probably written right around the year 80 of the Common Era or AD, the Common Era or AD. That's about 50 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Think back 50 years in your own life, if you can remember that far. If you're not old enough to do that, imagine your parents or your grandparents imagining 50 years back in their own life. Imagine how well stories traveled just in your own family. So imagine them circulating among an entire people before being written down. This is also 10 years after the destruction of the great temple in Jerusalem, which is important. The temple was the center of Jewish life in that day. The Romans eventually came in and raised it, set it on fire, pulled it down to the ground. This destruction ignited a great firestorm of controversy in Judaism about how to go on being Jewish, and it is into that firestorm that Matthew steps with his gospel. Although, maybe we shouldn't call him Matthew, it wasn't attributed to someone named Matthew until some almost 200 years later, depending on who you ask, maybe just 100 years later. Probably wasn't the tax collector that was mentioned in chapter 9 of the book, for those of you who read it over the last week. It's worth noting that the name Matthew is similar to the Greek word for disciple. But we have no other name for him, so... Let's call him Matthew. Whoever the author was, he was almost certainly, 99.9% .9 certainly, a Jew writing for other Jews, commenting on an argument between Jews. This is important because whenever Jesus has an argument with the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees, you cannot, you must not see that as an argument between Christians and Jews. This was an internal conversation they were having. After the temple fell, some people said that the way to continue being Jewish was to listen to the scribes and the Pharisees to take part in synagogue Judaism. And some people, Matthew among them, said the best way to continue being Jewish was to follow Jesus, the one who is the Messiah. They said God has, after all, provided for us. God has taken the temple away but given us a living temple instead. That's the fight that's going on here. That's why there are so many struggles going on in Matthew, so many people arguing back and forth, and why Jesus seems so grumpy in Matthew's telling of the story. It's also why there is such a long list of descendants 
right up front in Matthew because he wants to convince his Jewish readers that Jesus is the legitimate heir to their tradition. And so he packs every famous Jewish figure from history into that story that he can to convince you, the Jewish reader, of who Jesus is. It's also why Matthew quotes Jewish prophecy so much. No gospel writer quotes Jewish prophecy more than Matthew. You see it over and over again. This is what was said according to the prophets. Nobody but Jews would care about that. If this was a gospel written for someone other than Jewish people, they would have quoted other prophecies. The other people wouldn't have even known Jewish prophecies. So that's an important clue to who was writing and who they were writing for. One thing all Gospels share is a sort of episodic structure, a forced uh, framework that's put into each one. Each structure, each Gospel has a different structure. Matthew's, you may have noticed, is organized around these five great discourses where Jesus talks and talks and talks for one or two or three chapters at a time. And each one of these discourses ends with, and when he had finished saying these things, Jesus and then he goes off and does something else, moves around, does some miracles. One of these great discourses is the Sermon on the Mount, which is the reason most of us who love Matthew love it so. Matthew is the gospel of the Sermon on the Mount, almost all of which, you should note, is about ethics. Matthew is trying to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah, but it doesn't end there. He is trying to convince you that since he is the Messiah, you should do what he says and act the way he tells you to act, which is to say you should do things differently than Rome would or other Jews would. That's why Matthew is so often symbolized as a human. You can see one representation on the front of the bulletin. You may know that Matthew is usually symbolized as a human and Mark is a lion and Luke is an ox and John is an eagle. Matthew is a human because he's all about human concerns, human life, human problems, how to live as a human in a hard world. Some have claimed that the definition of a gospel, any gospel, is that it is a passion and resurrection narrative with an extended introduction. That may be, but not for Matthew. You know that that's not all there is for Matthew because of that moral earnestness. Do not worry, says Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus. Refe receive the kingdom like a child. Turn the other cheek. Let the dead bury their own dead. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And on and on and on go the admonitions. This is the defining characteristic of Matthew's gospel, moral earnestness and a concern for ethics. The Sermon on the Mount isn't all that's unique to this gospel, just to point out, because it might be interesting. Matthew is also the gospel, the only gospel that has the three wise men and the star, the flight to Egypt, and the massacre of the innocents, but note, no annunciation to Mary. It has the Great Commission. It has the version of the resurrection where the soldiers claim that the disciples stole Jesus' body to trick everyone into believing that he's resurrected. It has something like 11 parables that show up nowhere else in the Gospels, and a few more. There were, you should know, a lot more than four Gospels circulating once upon a time. Every once in a while, somebody writes a book, and we all gasp, and it becomes a bestseller because the Gospel of, you know, whoever has been discovered, and we all feel shocked that there were other Gospels out there that didn't make the cut. Uh, scholars are never surprised by this. The reason that these four made the cut, some of it is political, but for the most part, the reason that any of the four Gospels made it in is this. They were the ones that were designed to build up the church, not to inform you in your private spirituality at home, not to convince you what you ought to do with your children at home, not to convince you how to work at, in your life. It was about building up the church. There were ethical concerns telling individuals how to live, but it was individuals in community. So Gospel of Thomas didn't make it. Gospel of Mary didn't make it. They were too private in their concerns. These four made it because they are community books to be read by the church and to be based, or, and for the church to base its life on. The hinge of Matthew, the place where everything, uh, around which everything swirls, the place where the story turns, is this part not the temptation, but when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Son of Man means Jesus here. 
And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by humans, but by my parent in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter is the rock, of course, but he's not the only rock in this story. This is what Matthew wants you to know. The rock is the confession that Peter made. The rock is this statement. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the rock on which he would build his church, is the rock on which he would be broken, is the rock on which you might stumble, is the rock to which you ought to cling, is the rock on which the universe stands. So says Matthew anyway. See you next week for Mark.